Welcome guys. Um, let's just give it a few more minutes whilst everyone jumps in. We've got attendees coming through now. Looks like the doors are opening pretty quickly. Okay, we've just hit 11 o'clock, but it looks like we've still got a few more people coming through. So I might give it one more minute and then we'll kick things off. All right, I think we'll kick things off from there. So welcome everybody to the first in a series of insights events that IRI hosting based on the liquor category. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to um, thank you all for coming and introduce myself. My name is Jana and I have the privilege of being your host and moderator for today. I am the lead consultant for liquor within the New South Wales business in IRI, and I am joined by Delphine Lambert and Lachlan Cameron, who will be your presenters today. Um, just a few quick little housekeeping things to keep get things going. I guess the beauty of this format is there's no need for me to point you in the direction of the exits or the toilets, um, but there are a few little pieces of information that I thought it was important to share. Firstly, uh, we will be moderating the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, so please feel free to post questions throughout the presentation and I will be sure to try and get back to you as soon as possible. Um, I will actually monitor some of the questions coming through so that we can leave a little bit of time towards the end of the presentation to answer live a couple of the themes that are coming through. For anyone that I don't get to during the presentation, don't worry, um, we can actually respond to those posts and I will be sure to get back to you. Now just to set a little bit of a scene before we move forward and I hand over, I just wanted to let everybody know that though this presentation is very much focused on Australia and the opportunity of seltzers within that market. I would like a quick little kia ora to our Kiwi cousins across the water and just let you know that though, yes, we are focused on Australia, the information shared is very relevant as well for the New Zealand market. So please feel free to reach out to myself or Dave Goldstein if you have any um, questions moving forward from a Kiwi perspective. The information that we are sharing is um, collated based on information uh, derived from both the Australian, UK and American market reads based on IRI data, as well as uh, surveys and panel metrics from both Australia and the US. Um, and we will also provide in-store observations throughout the presentation. All data is pre-summer for the Northern Hemisphere and to the end of the financial year for Australia. To kick things off, I thought it was important to lend a little bit of perspective uh, to the differing markets um, in the US and Australia. And so I thought I'd come back to the very basics and 
all those that know Americans know that they believe bigger is better. Pretty much everything in America is double the size of how we operate in the Australian market. And pretty much the only thing I can think of that that isn't relevant to is actually the size of the countries. So though the US territory is only 1.3 times larger than Australia, we do actually see that their population is significantly larger. So the US population is 300 million more than Australia's 25 million. And this means that the perspective impact of growth is pretty high, as well as the sheer size of what their markets could be. In saying that, the US liquor market is actually only four times larger than the Australian, which seems a bit disproportionate. Um, when you think about it. And the logical answer to that is that us Aussies just drink more than our American counterparts, which is not necessarily untrue, but really it's actually more to do with what the US alcohol market is made up of. So if you think about the makeup and what's available in the US um, and what shares they kind of come into. Um, further to that, it has greatly to do with the sheer price of each individual product. Um, so the dollars per litre is much less in the US market versus what we pay here in Australia. Now, lastly, before I hand over to the presenters for today, I thought it important to share just a few little definitions and terminology that we will be using throughout the presentation. Uh, first up, a bit of a definition of seltzer itself, because it is a relatively new term in Australia. Quite simply, it means sparkling water. So when you start looking at what hard seltzers is, it, it translates directly to an alcoholic sparkling water. Further to this, you will hear us speak to flavoured malt beverages, also known as FMB, which is a sub-segment um, in the US that hard seltzers fall into. Now, FMB actually falls within the beer category in the US and is the number one driver driven by seltzers uh, in the US at the moment. Further to this, uh, you will also hear of us speaking of MATs or moving annual totals. That's quite a logical term for a lot of people, but we have quite a wide audience here. So I just wanted to assure everyone that when we're talking MAT, it just means the latest 12 months of data. But without anything further to do, I will hand over to our presenters, starting with Delphine, who is going to open up on what the opportunity will be on seltzers. Thanks, Dana. So if there is uh, one thing that we really want you uh, all to remember from this presentation today, it's really that one sentence on this slide. So hard seltzers do present a huge opportunity for the Australian market. But as we see throughout this presentation, we can't just lift and shift what has worked in the US and just expect the segment to be as successful in our country. So we look into this into a little bit more detail throughout our presentation, which is um, divided into four sections. So um, first, we will have a look at the art seltzer segment in the US and how it has become such a big trend in this country. Then in section two, we will explore some of the reasons for this success. And you see we have identified um, some key consumer needs that Celsius is really delivering on. Then we will talk about the Australian market and some of the watch charts about comparing our market with the US. And finally, in section four, we will address some of these challenges and identify how to best capitalize uh, on hard sources in Australia, given the market dynamics in our country. So basically section one and section two, we will be looking at US data only. And then uh, in section three, we'll bring it back to Australia of comparing our market with the US. And section four would be just focusing on the Australian market and what the opportunity is um, there. So let's get into it. So hard seltzers have boomed in the US. I think it's a secret for nobody how big of a success hard seltzers currently are in the US. Everyone who is a little bit interested in the US market has heard or read about this segment. So as we can see here, hard sources are now worth close to $2 billion and are still growing triple digit with an acceleration of growth um, in 2019 compared to the previous year. Also, we see that 80% of the segment value has actually been generated just in the past two years. And I think 
there is no better way um, than on this chart to really uh, look at uh, the, the explosion of hard sales sales in the past two years. We've also seen a lot of new launches in that period where basically in 2017, there were only five salsa brands uh, present in the US market compared to 52 at the end of 2019. So we've had an increase of more than 10 times the amount of brands in just those two years. Now what that means uh, in terms of active products, well, that means that by the end of 2019, we had almost 240 um, different salsa products in, the re in retail in the US. So even though we have seen an explosion of new brands entering the market, uh, it's really just one brand that has driven all this growth and that's White Claw. So White Claw is now omnipresent in the salsa segment. They've really gained uh, so much brand awareness that they are now a completely standardized brand. So at the end of 2019, White Claw reached um, just about 60% distribution in the US and was also um, worth 76% of the total salsa um, segment. So that's at the end of uh, 2019. Now fast forward a few months and when we look at data from uh, mid-May, we can see that uh, the strong success of some other brands have actually challenged a wide close share of hard salsa. So here we are looking at the top six hard seltzer brand in the US, which are ranked high low depending on their size, or from their size sorry, from left to right. So if we start with number two, um, Truly. So Truly has really uh, seen a strong success through the rebranding and the change of their packaging designed to mimic white claw. So Truly started in 2016. Um, back then they were called Truly Sparked and Sparkling. And after seeing white claw success throughout 2018, Three decided to swap the sparked and sparkling for hard seltzer. What they did as well is changing their packaging design. So um, they were selling bottles before and now they've, they've changed that to clean cans with a white background. So really very similarly to, to white claw. Then uh, we have all the AB InBev brands like Bud Light, but they also distribute Bonneville, the number four, and Natural Light, the number six. Um, so Bud Light was only in market since um, a few months, uh, but what they've done really, really well is leveraging the strength of the Budweiser brand, which has really helped uh, Bud Light Seltzer uh, to um, gain large distribution in such a short amount of time. So as example, Bud Light is available now in twice as many stores within just weeks of being released compared to its competitors during their first year of launch. Now, something that helped that brand as well is the huge push it got uh, through the Super Bowl ads that were released ahead of the game and where AB and Bev basically let social media decide which one they wanted to add during the game. Last brand up here, we have Smirnoff. Um, they also have a variety of flavors and they also launched their limited edition cans, which, it, which did really well. Um, so that was for 4th of July and Labor Day. The, the Smirnoff products actually have around 8% ABV, which is higher than that normal uh, 4 to 5% that we see with other brands. Um, but even with that, uh, the, drinks have, the drinks have zero sugar and have around 67 calories per serving, so really attractive. Now, what's interesting to see is that we have only six brands on this slide, which basically represent 96% of um, the total sales of value while there are around 70%, uh, 70 sorry, brands uh, in total in the US market. So some common points between those six brands and why they've done so well. First of all, they've gained um, high distribution really quickly. And then most of them have had uh, large marketing support for their introduction to market. Now, I think something that still stands out from this slide is uh, white close dominance in the salsa market. And White Claw is the number one largest hard salsa brand, but they've also become the largest um, flavored more beverage brand, growing triple digit um, in the past year and delivering over a billion dollars just in the past 12 months. So yeah, three things to consider um, for this success story. 
First of all, um, the context. So since 2010, we've seen rising concerns about obesity in America with some key government-led initiatives that have been put in place. Um, so that really planted the seed of a change in people's mindsets. Just after that, we've seen a boom of sparkling water sales and especially uh, flavored sparkling water. So having that alcoholic uh, version was almost a natural next step. So we have here a better for you drink, doesn't make you bloat, still makes you, still gets you drunk after uh, drinking a few and it has a lot less calories and sugar than most other alcoholic drinks. And something White Claw has done extremely well is imposing itself in this context. The brand has also been able to reach a lot of people. So first of all, through social media, where in 2000, uh, 2018, the hashtag White Claw Life, sorry, really took social media by storm. People started um, to become curious about the brand that summer, and uh, that's really when the White Claw craze started. They even had a, a shortage actually in uh, 2019. So the brand has now really a strong presence on social media and so much so that people now refer to the hard seltzer segment as being white claw. So people would say, um, let's have a claw instead of let's, say, let's have a hard seltzer. Something that has helped white claw as well is that it's packaging. You know, it has um, a slim cans with Instagram friendly designs set, set against a white background. So that's really the perfect drink to take a photo with and then post on your social media. Now, compared to other um, hard seltzer brands, but especially compared to Truly, the number two brand, White Claw has really done a better job also at penetrating both uh, in retail, at penetrating both large format retailers of so food and drug, but also um, smaller formats like the convenience channel. Then one last point I want to make on this slide is um, that White Claw has really perfectly leveraged um, the hard seltzers broad appeal. So uh, White Claw has avoided to market to a specific customer base, really making you know, the drink age and gender neutral. It's also easy for people to choose because there is one brand that represents a whole segment. So when shoppers are in store, it's really easy for them um, to pick this brand. Now, something to keep in mind as well is that the maker of White Claw, so Mark Anthony Brands, um, they're also manufacturing Mark's Hard Lemonade. So they were already leaders in that RTD FMB space, even before the hard seltzer boom. So they really understand this space better than um, a lot of other hard seltzer suppliers. So now uh, I'll give um, control to Lucky, who is going to talk to you about uh, why some of the reasons why hard seltzers have worked um, really well in the US. Well, Fiend, uh, my name's Lachlan Cameron, and uh, I'm going to touch on now the why. Why has uh, hard seltzers been so successful in the US? Now, before I get to that, I'm actually going to start and talk about the who. So, who is the quintessential hard seltzer consumer in the US? So, looking at some data from the IRI Consumer Network Panel, uh, what I can tell you is seltzer consumers are generally under the age of 45, from a life stage perspective, they are uh, younger families or getting started. From a household income point of view, they're earning over $70,000 combined. And uh, they generally have some university education or, or college education uh, as they'd refer to it over there. And if you just look at the right hand side of the screen, uh, we've created a profile of, of who that average seltzer consumer may well be. So getting on to the why, and I think it's really important to start with a little bit of context. Um, what we know is that in the US, beer's popularity uh, has certainly waned amongst younger generations. So looking at the left-hand side of the screen, uh, we can see that millennials are less engaged with almost every major beer brand, uh, and that's compared to baby boomers or, or Gen X. When we look at the total beer volume as well in the US, we can see that since 2015, uh, beer volumes have fallen on average around 0.3% per year. Uh, and it's also important to note that that number excludes FMB, which, which is where uh, hard seltzers does sit. 
we look at the switching data, and this is the source of volume for hard seltzers, we can see that 48% of hard seltzers volume is coming from switching from uh, consumers consuming other categories within beer, wine and spirits. And we can see that two thirds of the volume there is in fact coming from beer. So there's a, there's a clear link between beer and uh, that shifting preference across the hard seltzers. I think it's also important to call out that uh, we can see that 12% there and that's gains from new beer, wine and spirits buyers. And I think this really speaks to uh, the proposition that hard seltzers offers and the fact that it offers something different. It's attracting new people to the total liquor category that hadn't previously uh, been purchasing liquor. So clearly it's a, it's a uh, new and novel proposition that's um, really resonating with, the, with a broad audience. It's also important to note that within the US, uh, the RTV market is particularly small. So um, this does create an opportunity for a flavoured alternative and, and that's where hard seltzers come in. Um, so there's a few elements that we should understand uh, when thinking about that size of the RTD segment. We do believe that the fact that there is uh, little to no RTD segment in that market, um, a segment which accounts for under 2% of the total liquor landscape in that market, um, we believe that that's tied to the fact that hard seltzer took quite a number of years to actually gain momentum because there's not a similar option uh, from people to jump in from. Um, so perhaps a larger barrier to entry in that regard. Uh, but I think ultimately it's important to consider without that established RTD segment within the US, uh, there's, there's a greater size of opportunity. So there is less competition with a directly substitutable option. If we uh, apply that similar logic to the Australian market, uh, in this country we do, we all know on this call that we do have an established RTD category. And that category accounts for around 15% of the market in Australia. So um, there's a couple of factors there. We think that that will quite possibly help the acceptance of hard seltzers. So um, there is options which are similar. So it's not a huge leap for someone to jump into a category such as hard seltzer. But ultimately this may impact the size uh, that the, the hard seltzer market may achieve in the US. Um, there's simply greater competition. Uh, now, we wanted to talk a little bit about the, the key consumer needs that hard seltzers has satisfied in the US and really the reasons why it's been so successful. So uh, we're going to go through these on the subsequent slides, but these concepts are around uh, health and wellness. We're going to talk to the notion of social and sessionable. We're going to talk to how can, uh, hard seltzers touches on a number of convenience angles, how it offers uh, flavour and variety. And lastly, I think a really strong point here is around the accessible price point of, of the segment in the US market as well. Uh, so firstly, touching on the notion of health and wellness, we know that this concept uh, has ex existed in the US market for some 40 years, but uh, in the last 10 years, it's certainly become uh, significantly more mainstream. Uh, and look, this certainly has implications for uh, the way that people consume alcohol. We can see with this quote on the left-hand side here, uh, we can see that there's 77% of US adults taking steps to actively improve their health. Um, and, and yes, this does impact the way people consume alcohol. Uh, we do know that um, some years ago, beer started to develop a reputation of, of uh, being less good for people. Um, we saw a number of craft brands take a step to actually put the number of calories of those drinks uh, onto the cans or the beer, onto the cans or the bottles, should I say. And this is a concept that Hard Seltz has actually uh, has taken as, and has run with, and it's become a really strong, unique selling point for this category, because uh, it's generally under uh, 100 calories. And as you can see on the right, um, it's a healthier proposition than some of these other options. From a uh, social and sessionable perspective, we do know that there are a growing number of US consumers who are taking steps to actively reduce the amount of alcohol that they're consuming. So uh, if we look at the left hand side, we can see that nearly half of the US population and uh, two thirds of millennials are keen to actually cut back on the amount of alcohol that they're consuming. So that's not cutting out alcohol together, but that's, um, that's just moderating, that's consuming in a way that they want to remain in control and consume alcohol in a responsible manner. So um, 
and often such as hard seltzer. If you look at the right hand side, you can see from an ABV perspective, it's generally a lower ABV option around four to 5%. So um, certainly helps those individuals who have that mindset um, when it comes to consumption of alcohol. Uh, the other point just to note on that is there's also another uh, number of consumers who wish to consume alcohol across long periods um, in a session and hard seltzers, the proposition really does lend itself uh, very well to that style of consumption as well. I've, uh, I've mentioned the notion of convenience and we know that hard seltzers really ticks a number of boxes when we talk about convenience and, and it's really allowed the option to be applicable to so many different occasions. Uh, we know that hard seltzers is uh, generally served in a slimline can, which makes it very much easily transportable. Uh, it's easy to consume on the go. It has that benefit of people not having to mix their own drinks. But uh, as I've alluded to on the previous two slides, there is that convenience of being able to manage how much alcohol you're consuming, but also manage your calorie intake uh, while consuming seltzers as well. From a uh, flavours perspective, um, we have alluded to the fact that beer's popularity in uh, the US, particularly amongst a, a younger audience, has certainly waned. And part of that is down to this uh, switching preference to a sweeter uh, flavour profile. Uh, this quote on the left, we can see, it states that uh, among 21 to 27 year old consumers who are drinking fewer mass market beers, 40% uh, of those are doing so because they're in fact getting tired of the taste. Now look, certainly some of those consumers may be switching into craft beer, but I think it's hard to argue when we've looked at uh, the source of switching, clearly a lot of volume coming in through beer. Uh, we have seen total beer volumes declining and the phenomenal growth of hard seltzers really does validate the fact that this sweeter profile is, is a really attractive proposition to a, a lot of uh, uh, former beer consumers. In addition to that, the variety option, uh, we know that a lot of people consuming hard seltzers uh, love the variety aspect of it. And um, that's certainly validated by the fact that over 50% of White Claw's volume is in fact sold in the mixed pack. So people wanna buy a pack and have different flavors within the same session. Uh, and just the same four out of the six top growth SKUs in the whole of hard seltzers are in fact those, uh, those mixed packs. And um, the last point I'll make in this section really is around the palatable price point of seltzers, which we believe to be a, a major driver behind the fact that the segment has had uh, such widespread embracement. So um, I'll just note that on this slide, all the figures are converted to Australian dollars. So I've just put a, the cost of a Big Mac on the top left there. Uh, just keep that in the back of your mind for the moment. On the right hand side of the screen, I've got a cost of a 12 pack of hard seltzers in the US, which is around 23 uh, Australian dollars. And uh, what we can see when we come back to looking at the Big Mac, from an Australian perspective, uh, the Big Mac is costing around $6.60. Now we can see that that's clearly a dollar cheaper than, than in the US. Uh, but when we actually look across to the cost of a 12 pack of hard seltzer in the US, we can see that it's more than twice the cost of that same format in, uh, in the US. So, sorry, it's in Australia, it's twice the cost of what it would be in the US. So um, clearly a, quite a different proposition in the US. It's very much a mainstream option, whereas um, we can see that that same option in Australia will certainly be more of a premium proposition. Um, and I think that that's a, that's a great segue to pass over to Delphine who's now going to talk about uh, some of the important dynamics that we need to consider in the Australian market. Thanks, Loki. So yes, indeed, um, you know, market dynamics are quite different between Australia and the US. So we really can't just look at what has worked in the US and think that it's going to be the same in our country. So in this section, what I'm going to do is really um, talk you through a few of the considerations that we really need to keep in mind. Um, when launching a hard seltzers in our country. First thing uh, to think about is that actually hard seltzers have a low, very low awareness and understanding in our country. So on the left hand side, um, we can see that when we ask our, our shopper panel, which of the following liquor types have you seen in Australia? Just 5% of them recognize a hard seltzer. 
on top of that, we've asked our shopper panel, which of the following uh, would you use to describe a hard seltzers? And 55% of them have said, uh, you know, that they've never heard of it and they really don't know what it is. So um, this is a really different picture from what it is in the US where basically um, both the word hard and seltzers are already part of uh, US citizens vocabulary. So in the US, uh, people use seltzer to refer to sparkling water. They use hard to designate any type of alcoholic drink. And we've seen that sparkling water has become really popular in the US since the past um, six to uh, seven to eight years with the, the brand Lacroix um, really trending before the alcoholic uh, seltzers came into market. So that has really, really paved the way for the alcoholic version to do well um, in the US market. Now, another way to look at the impact of awareness is looking at a few examples of brand sales. Here we're looking at Quincy. So as we said, unknown segment, people don't really understand what um, hard sales are. Quincy has delivered just above $2 million um, within their, their first 10 months in market. Then if we add to this, just looking at Koyomi, um, so new brand, however, the Haibo cocktail um, is already well known thank, uh, in the on-premise. And then after that, uh, just looking at an established category like beer, where Goat Lager has um, delivered almost $14 million in the first 10 months in market. So all of those brands have similar distribution levels nationally. However, in terms of uh, sales generated by each brand are really, really different. And another example here I just wanted to talk to you about is uh, the example of Red's Apple Ale. So this brand really started in the US. However, it didn't work in us when they brought this in Australia. Um, so that brand was really well supported by retailers in Australia. It reached um, around 75% distribution during its first year of launch and it was launched nationally directly. However, it still didn't pick up in our country because people just didn't understand uh, the proposition of this brand. Another good example here, I think, is really looking at canned wine. So we know this segment is booming in the US. However, even with retailer support uh, in Australia, it uh, didn't take off yet. Something else to consider is um, the current context that we live in. Uh, and you know, COVID-19 is really causing Australians to adjust their behavior um, quite uh, drastically sometimes. So, what this means uh, for the hard salsa segment, well, first of all, people are likely to eat out less, so both for health and wealth reasons, um, which means that the on-premise won't work as a usual vessel to educate shoppers about a new liquor segment. Then also, a big part of shoppers um, spend the least time possible in-store, which really impacts exploration of new products. So it is, it is a hard time to get people to try something new because um, a lot of us have more conservative mindsets and we are more closed off to um, product discovery. And one last point is really, you know, currently um, we, we are living in an antisocial environment which will impact the occasion-led consumption and really hinder outdoor launch events. So, the pandemic is uh, impacting us from uh, a social perspective, but it's also impacting us from uh, a financial perspective. Where here we can see on the left hand side, um, we have almost 50% of our shopper panel that tell us that they are worse off from a financial perspective uh, compared to pre-COVID. And then we also have almost 90% of our shopper panel telling us that they think uh, that this is gonna, the, that sort of economic impact is going to last for more than 12 months. So concerns about personal finances are going to inhibit, uh, you know, people trialing something new. And in this context, uh, consumers' perception of the value of sales will really be um, a key aspect of its success. And when we look at millennials, uh, more specifically, we can see that 13% of them have just stopped buying alcoholic drinks because it doesn't fit into their budget anymore. 
and 28% of them also say um, that they still buy alcoholic drinks, but they buy the lower end of the price range. Now, millionaires being the target audience for hard seltzers, well, if they don't buy, that will, uh, that will shrink our market. So COVID has really shifted uh, price perception across millennials because pre-pandemic, um, most millennials were saying that they were happy to pay a price premium. So in this context, I think the question is really, how long is this financial insecurity going to last and what is going to be um, the impact for hard seltzers? Because as we can see, hard seltzers are a pretty expensive offering in our market. Um, so here, if we focus our attention on the left-hand side of the of the slides, you have uh, a chart showing you the average um, um, price per liter. So uh, we've converted everything in Australian dollars uh, for some key you know, for all the key liquor categories. So if we focus first on uh, the blue line, so the Australian data, yes, we can see that there is you know potential uh, trade up. Uh, here uh, from cider or more specifically from craft uh, beers, or there is a potential trade down from RTD. However, when we compare um, that blue, uh, the Australian data, so that blue line with the red line with the US data, we can see that in our, in our country, hard seltzers are a lot more expensive than they are in the US. So in the US, that segment has um, a mainstream reach, which uh, will be definitely different um, in our market. And we have that, um, you know, quite premium offering. Um, however, what we've seen in across retailers is that Celsius have been promoted quite a lot already. Now, the positive is, well, it will attract new shoppers and will have great trial. However, there are two negative aspects to this. Um, first one being that it's going to generate uh, confusion around what the right price is. So, um, hard seltzers is in its infancy, uh, and I think at the moment we really need to focus on educating shoppers about the segment and what the right value is. Second thing to consider as well is that in the medium to long term, there may be real issues with generating conversion and high repeat rates. Now, if we stay in uh, the retail environment, uh, it's good to note as well that in the US, hard seltzers are, um, you know, range in supermarkets. So they can be part, they can be purchased as part of um, that broader shopping trip. And then in the, within the fridge, hard seltzers sit at the premium end of the fridge. So, and as we've seen before, uh, so, so they're, sorry, they are at the premium end of the fridge. So sitting next to, you know, premium craft beers, which we've seen before are on average more expensive than um, hard seltzer. So hard seltzer become that easy uh, product uh, to pick in store. Now, if we take that to um, Australia, so here we're looking at um, photos from two different retailers. So we can see on the left, hard seltzers um, sit between light art India and spritz. And then on the right hand side, well, hard seltzers are ranged in the side of fridge. Now, if the segment is ranged with different segments in different channels, this will really confuse consumers about uh, the product proposition and it's ultimately going to impact um, the success of this new segment. So, you know, brands in Australia already have to compete uh, for a share of space in the fridge. So that makes, um, you know, in-store execution even more important. And I think this is really where, you know, suppliers will play a pivotal role, driving the consistency across their retail partners. And something to keep in mind as well, uh, while we're looking at the fridge is really, where hard sensors will be sitting in the fridge will really determine uh, which categories it will cannibalize volume from. And um, something that we've seen is that um, you know, if we range Celsius with cider and RTD, well, that's the audience, the segment will attract. And that audience, well, um, is a lot smaller than uh, the audience we have for beer. Now, here on the left, we can see that, uh, you know, from our shopper panel, so from people consuming alcohol, 60% of them have consumed beer in the past six months compared to just 29% for RTD and 27% for cider. So beer 
has a way higher uh, penetration. And then when we look at the category um, sales value, where we can see even, you know, additioning uh, cider and RTD together, well, we have uh, a much smaller pie uh, than if we were to, to range ourselves uh, with beer. And um, one last point I want to make in this section is that, you know, we've seen almost 80% of uh, so eighty percent of our shopper panel tell us that um, their liquor purchases are planned prior to entering a liquor store. So it is really a challenge uh, for emerging categories to get noticed. So in this context, shopper education will be even more important. And this is really where we see uh, you know the opportunity for suppliers and retailers to partner together in order to drive education around uh, this new segment. And now. Um, Lucky is going to take over and talk you through um, some other opportunities that you know we see um, in the Australian market to um, best capitalize on the hard sales segment. Thank you, Delphine. Uh, so, as Delphine alluded to, I'll be talking about how we can really maximize the hard seltzer opportunity in Australia. Now, to build on Delphine's previous points. Um, it is important to note that retailers will play a really important role in this um, and their role will be about the education component, but also enticing trial as well. So um, via in-store execution, we think there's a real strong opportunity for uh, the retailers to make it clear what is a hard seltzer, make it very clear what are some of the unique product benefits that hard seltzers has, and then also make some recommendations around what are the suitable occasions to consume a hard seltzer. The reality is, um, as we've seen, there's not a lot of awareness or education, so um, the retailers will play a key role in driving that. Uh, another thing we just wanted to call out here is, is a great um, promotional mechanic we've noticed uh, from Dan Murphy's, and this is a, a mix and match promotion, um, essentially encouraging people to sample multiple brands at a time with a view that hopefully they try a few different options, they find one they like, and they will ultimately come back to the category again and again. Um, it's also important to note that we see the role of retailers uh, being a little bit different in a big box versus a convenience style format. Um, we know in a big box, uh, consumers shopping there uh, are quite often in a much more exploratory uh, sort of mindset. So they're coming in with um, a mindset that they may be open to finding something new. Uh, so there's an opportunity to drive those individuals to a part of the store and then to educate them with displays such as this one. That's in contrast to the convenience style format where people are coming in with a very clear uh, shopping mission in mind. And we're going to need to be a lot more blunt and disruptive to actually uh, get that person to pay attention to this emerging segment. So um, off, uh, off location displays by the register or perhaps discounts with, uh, with purchase may be a way to get um, hard seltzers into the hands of, of these convenience store consumers. But um, look, in addition to the um, in-store uh, in format, online is also going to play a really important role driving education, but also driving trial of, of hard seltzers as well. Uh, we've again included an example here from the Dan Murphy's website, and we just wanted to call out a few uh, really important elements that we've noted. So uh, looking at point number one, um, we all know that hard seltzers has some, has some great uh, uh, unique attributes and I think the the notion of calling out these key product benefits is really important and um, will, will be a real key selling point for this segment. The second point, uh, guidance around suitable occasions. So uh, if you can see the header above, there is some uh, direction toward consuming hard seltzers at a, at a picnic or um, at the beach. So uh, some fantastic direction there. And then the last point is around um, this education. Uh, accompanying that with some really strong promotional offers. Uh, and a recent IRI survey that we've conducted of uh, consumers who had bought liquor online, 48% of those in fact uh, did so to take advantage of online only offers. So uh, we can see that these sorts of offers really do resonate with an online audience. Uh, it's also important to note that uh, we all know that online is certainly a growing channel. Uh, and it's growing in importance post COVID. We have seen that uh, with a recent survey that the panel, the IRI panel conducted uh, before COVID, 19% of uh, consumers had bought liquor online. That number's actually increased to 25% uh, 
uh, post COVID. So clearly growing in importance. Uh, in addition to the role that retailers play, we see brands playing a really important role, uh, calling out the key product benefits of hard seltzers, educating consumers, but ultimately helping to justify uh, the premium that this segment sits at. So uh, by using really strong functional messaging, we can see the segment's going to do a great job to attract that health conscious consumer uh, and, and we'll be able to justify the premium. So calling out things such as lower calorie, uh, gluten free, whether it's vegan friendly, uh, all these key elements or, or even transparency around production, because we know that that can be a, a key selling point to these sorts of consumers as well. And um, as, a, as I've touched on, amplifying seltzer att attribute advantages will be a real uh, key selling point in generating switching from other categories or segments as well. So by calling those um, better few credentials out, it'll be clear that uh, hard seltzers is, is a lower calorie option. It's gluten free and it's healthier than beer versus perhaps a cider, uh, a shopper with, with that in mind, will see that seltzers is less sugary. It's a less sweet option. Uh, versus wine, it will be become very clear that uh, hard seltzers is lower ABV, it's more sessionable and perhaps better suited to a daytime occasion. And lastly, we've talked about the fact that seltzers will be ranged with RTD and um, it will become clear that uh, it's, it's a less sugary option and uh, it's likely to be cheaper as well. And um, we can take some great lessons, in fact, from the zero alcohol category and, uh, and CUB. We've done a fantastic job conveying the benefits of non-alcoholic beers versus soft drinks in their recent communication for Carlton Zero. Uh, what we can see in this communication is that it's very clear who they're targeting. They are going after that soft drink consumer. And uh, what we can also note is that they are they are going after the soft drink consumer on the basis that non-alcoholic beer has clearly less sugar. So that's the key selling point of the product. And we can see the versatility of occasions uh, in these comms. It's clear that it's been consumed at lunchtime. So clearly a very versatile option. As a result here, Carlton Zero has generated 18 million uh, in sales in the latest MAT. And it's in fact become the number one non-alcoholic beer in Australia. So just a great example of, of how you can use functional benefits for, uh, for, the, for the benefit of the brand and the category. However, it is important to note that functional messaging alone uh, may lead to a lack of differentiation for the category. So, um, and we see this as being a bit of a challenge to potentially some of the brands, but also the broader category as well. Uh, detrimental to the brand in the sense that uh, if we have a bunch of brands playing in this quite similar functional space, uh, there may be a lack of differentiation um, and individuals may not come back and purchase your brand when they re-enter the category. Um, from a category perspective though, the challenge will be that the category may ultimately have quite a narrow appeal and uh, we're only going to um, attract quite a narrow niche audience. So um, by having a, a greater breadth of offering, uh, it's going to attract a bigger audience and ultimately have a stronger penetration as well. I suppose the, the key message from this is really for brands, they really need to stand out, which will help them thrive individually, but also it will help boost the category and, uh, and have broader appeal as well. Um, we've included another example, and I think Mercury Hard Cider is a testament of a brand playing outside category norms for the betterment of itself, but also for the broader category. Uh, we know that cider can often be described as a category of same, and um, a number of years ago, the Mercury brand was really struggling, and uh, a decision was made to launch a new sub-brand with a view to turning around the fortunes of that brand. What was created was... Uh, ultimately a, a, mass, a more masculine option in the cider category, an option with higher ABV, an offering that took some uh, dark RTD overtones and something that really stood out on the shelf. And, and the result for this was that the Mercury brand turned its fortunes around. Um, Mercury Hard Cider has been the number one growth brand in cider for the last six years. And it ultimately broadened the appeal of the cider category. So um, yeah, a really positive story for both the brand and broader category there. Uh, speaking of the role that brands will play in an emerging segment, we do see bigger and smaller brands playing uh, somewhat differing roles. So just to start off talking about big brands, 
uh, big brands have that opportunity to really generate broad, uh, large scale awareness for the segment. Um, particularly if, if we're dealing with the big known brands, such as you can see Corona in the back of that image, which, which is a seltzer brand in the US. Um, these sorts of brand act as a beacon and can attract people to this emerging segment. They can also uh, have the opportunity to really educate consumers about the functional benefits of that segment as well, and ultimately strive to be, to be the category captain or the, the segment captain. On the flip side though, smaller brands, uh, they have somewhat of a different role. Their role is, is really to differentiate, to really stand out on shelf, to offer something different, uh, carve out their own profitable niche, which will ultimately serve to broaden that segment appeal as well. And um, if we just step forward and have a look at an example of a brand uh, who's actually doing this successfully. So in the US, Copperberg uh, has had some phenomenal success and really demonstrates uh, the benefit that a big, powerful brand can have to an emerging segment uh, in Seltzer that we can see here. So Copperberg was the leading cider brand, or sorry, is the leading cider brand, I should say, in the UK. And um, if you look at the right-hand side of the screen, we can see uh, versus Mike's Hard Seltzer, which was within the segment, within the hard seltzer segment in the UK for six months. And that brand had much higher distribution. And yet due to the superior brand awareness of Copperberg, once it entered the category, uh, it quite quickly drove some really strong sales results and uh, brought a lot of new consumers to the category. So uh, the key message there is that um, certainly the, with the segment from which a category comes through will have an impact on uh, some of the switching behavior. So Copperberg being a cider brand, uh, we know that that brand drove switching from the cider category. And um, if we think about this in the Australian context, uh, could a brand such as Smirnoff play a similar role in being that uh, major brand, that category beacon bringing people in, but also will that ultimately drive uh, significant switching from the RTD category as well? Uh, the last point I'll touch on is really around uh, variety packs. Um, we know that we've talked about previously that variety packs are a proven format within hard seltzers. We've talked about White Claw's success with that format. Uh, but we also know in Australia that the variety pack format is, is a proven winner. We've seen with vodka cruises in the last uh, number of years, it's been particularly successful, generating $21 million worth of sales in the last MAT. Um, and that's really around that, that variety proposition. People want to have different options when they're consuming within the same session as well. So that's a real opportunity for hard seltzers in the Australian market. Uh, now I think let's, uh, let's wrap up. Let's do a bit of a recap on what we've just talked about. So uh, we've talked about some of the different dynamics in the Australian market. So we've talked about the fact that uh, the hard seltzer segment has little to no awareness and that's could quite possibly be a challenge. We've talked about the fact that the seltzer name doesn't necessarily resonate with an audience uh, as strongly as it may have done in, in the US market. We have talked about the fact that there is some uncertainty around where hard seltzers sit uh, amongst the different retailers. And we've also talked about the challenges that COVID-19 presents to a launch such as this, uh, implications for the types of social gatherings which hard seltzers may be consumed within but also the impact on uh, individuals' personal finances and um, their proclivity to try new options as well. Uh, it brings me to my next point, which is around that premium price point. We've talked about the fact that hard seltzers is very much a, a mainstream proposition in the US, but uh, due to various factors so far, we've seen it's, it's certainly much more of a premium offering in the Australian market. And lastly, we've talked about the fact that uh, in Australia, we are so far ranging the segment with the RTD segment. And we see that potentially that may be a, a smaller size of opportunity uh, than if we were to attempt to attract more of a beer oriented audiences as they have done in the US. But look, it's not all doom and gloom. There are some steps that we can take to really maximize the opportunity within the Australian market. Uh, firstly, we've talked about in-store execution and how important that will be to, to educate consumers, but also drive trial. Uh, we've talked about the role that brands will play, uh, talking about the key uh, product benefits that um, allow hard seltzers to stand out from its competitors. And, um, and that will really help that segment justify the premium that we will be charging for the segment in this market. 
Uh, we've also talked about the role that brands play and, and the importance of differentiating uh, both for their own benefit, but also for the benefit of the broader category and having a uh, broad category appeal. Uh, we've also talked about the, the role that large brands will play in acting as that beacon in bringing people from, from other segments and attracting people to hard seltzers. And lastly, we've talked about variety packs, uh, the fact that they're a proven format for hard seltzers in the US, but also uh, we've seen evidence that that format works in Australia as well. Uh, we just wanted to finish today's presentation with uh, a forecast as to how, we, how big we believe the hard seltzer market could in fact get within Australia. Um, so just bear with me for a moment. What we're looking at here is, is value growth. So this is uh, the first five years of value growth for the US hard seltzer segment. That is the thick black line you can see. And uh, paired alongside that, we have three lines representing a forecast of the Australian market. So uh, we have the red dotted line, that is the pessimistic outlook. We have the solid blue line, which we believe to be the realistic uh, outlook for the hard seltzer market. And then above that, we have an optimistic projection as well. Uh, just a few things to keep in mind when we've built this projection and a number of concepts that we've talked about today. So uh, the fact that in the Australian market, we have, an established, uh, we have an established RTD segment. We think that that will be potentially somewhat of a challenge to the hard seltzer market. Uh, it may ultimately compromise the size that, that mark, this uh, segment could get to in Australia, but we also think it may have some benefit, certainly initially in, um, in the fact that there may be lower barriers for people to jumping in and trying a hard seltzer. Uh, we've also kept in mind the fact that uh, the price point of this segment uh, is significantly higher in the Australian market versus the US. So uh, this will have implications for penetration of the category, um, but it also may have you know, longer term uh, implications for the conversion and repeat purchase. Um, even if we are able to bring a lot of people into the category with um, significant discounted options, will they come back and keep in the category into the future with uh, that much higher unit price? Um, that may be a challenge as well. I think the other point to note here is that um, uh, we're not delusional enough to think that this is all gonna be incremental. So, um, sorry, just a question popped up. Uh, I should note that um, uh, we are optimistic about the segment. We think that hard seltzers ultimately could be worth $300 million by 2025. Uh, I might just pass over to Jana now and we might take a few questions. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Lockie. Um, we have had a lot of questions come through and I've been trying to get back to individuals as they come through and where there's been themes, I've tried to post that live. But there were three questions that really stood out as a general theme um, that have come through today. So I might start with those. I'll answer the first one. Will this presentation be available post? Uh, yes, it will be. We'll be sharing a copy of the recording to all attendees um, after this session. Um, and also for any of the questions I haven't been able to get to, because they were quite a lot, we'll look to be answering those after the session as well and we'll get back to you directly. But I've got a couple of themes that I wanna pass on to the panel. Uh, the first one being um, how seasonal have seltzers been in the US and do we see this also playing out locally? Yeah, I can go for that one. Um, Lucky, if you have anything to add, please go for it. Um, yeah, look, I think of course we see uh, some sort of seasonality with summer, you know, it's uh, the type of drink that is so easy to take to a barbecue, to a picnic with friends. So of course, it is a type of, you know, light RTD drink, light RTD when I say like in the industrial market that, you know, works better in summer. However, what we've seen in the US is that most of the, the switching is actually coming from light beer buyers. And that means that, you know, light beer, is really something you can consume all year round. So yes, a little bit of seasonality. Um, sales are doing better during summer. However, not, uh, not that much as well, just because the type of drink that it is, it is light, it is easy to drink. You can really have it all year, all year round. Thank you, Delphine. And the other question, conscious of time, the other question that popped up a few times is around um, 
large brands, corporate brands versus sort of smaller and um, craft. Now, you did talk about this already, Lockie, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you believe um, if large brands will dominate the Australian market or if you think the Australian consumer will act more like they do in the beer space um, looking for alternates when looking at craft. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really interesting question. I think as we've touched on, um, both will rely on each other for the benefit of the, the broader segment. So um, we will need the big brands to really establish this segment to drive its, its, its mainstream element as well. Um, I know we've started seeing some TVCs recently for, for Smirnoff, so certainly that will help uh, the total category and that will help the smaller brands as well. Um, I suppose it'll really come down to the type of consumer that we can attract. If we will be uh, attracting a craft beer or a beer style consumer, um, there's every chance that there could be, uh, you know, significant switching and jumping around and trying new products. Um, but I think it could be a little bit different if we're attracting predominantly an RTD consumer um, who's, who's potentially just more of a mainstream consumer. They find something they like and they're not, um, not as prone to trialing different brands then, um, we really could see dominance by the mainstream brands in this space. I think it will be interesting to see, um, as we've seen in the US, a lot of big beer brands have entered hard seltzers. So um, will we see that in the Australian market? I, I think only time will tell, but um, that will certainly be something interesting to keep an eye on. Great, thank you, Lucky. And now I apologize, guys, we have hit 12 o'clock. I do have a lot of questions still coming through, so we will be sure to get back to you over the next day or so. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. As I said early on, this is the first of a series of um, webinars that we are conducting through the liquor sector. Uh, our next one will be in November, so please register if you would like to understand how your shoppers are behaving in store. Um, we would love to take you through our new liquor lens product. So um, thank you again for today, and we will share this recording um, later this afternoon. Um, and have a great day. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.